Super excited about the word that God laid on my heart. And I have anticipation. And like, I, I, like, I get excited when I talk about the word of God. Like, it, like real excitement, not just like, I'm not sharing, I, like, I'm not sharing literature. I'm sharing life. Just life. Not only the life of Jesus, but the life of Mayo. Not only the life of Mayo, but the life of Elevate. We're sharing life because it's called the living word. So I would be wrong for not having anticipation. And let's all have anticipation together because anticip- anticipation it births revelation. And when we have revelation of Jesus, there's nothing, no devil in hell, no person, no sickness, no sin. Nothing can come against the revelation of Jesus Christ. But anticipation precedes revelation. And I'm anticipating. I'm anticipating God to really show up and bless us. So, um, you know, Will and I was coming down and I was wrestling, you know, with my message prepping, you know, God, you know, spoke to me and, you know, gave me a word. And, um, you know, and, and the whole kind of the tension of the word was, male, I think it's identities, said another way, I think it's names that we as Christians are not taking advantage of. Because a naming opportunity, it births benefits. So if you name something, you receive the benefits from the name. However, it's names that we might not be taking the benefits from. And I don't know if it's from unawareness, because some people might not be aware of the name, and that's okay. And I, 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 don't, I don't know if it's from ignorance. Like, I don't, just, I don't know. I heard, but I don't know about it because my knowledge needs to catch up to it. And some of it might be because of arrogance. And I would say arrogance is because when you hear a name that God put on you, but yet you think your action describes you better than the name that God gave you, that's arrogance. Because we have no legal right to make us the thing that we do when the creator created us, created us in his image and likeness and called us a name. So it's arrogance. Because it's several names that we're called in the meta narrative of scripture in scripture. And if we just go to the New Testament, I love Paul. Paul calls us a lot of names. He calls us the church. Everybody familiar with that name, the church? The church. That's a great name. I like that, Paul. Hey, Paul even calls us the body of Christ. Love that name, right? The body of Christ. How about this one? The bride of Christ. Any engaged? Females in here right now engaged at the campuses? No engaged? Well, I'm pray for, you know, singles, get engaged. <laughs> you know, he calls the bride of Christ. He calls us saints. Faithful saints. Paul calls us that. And then I think, hey, hey, let's, 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 go to the, let's go to the brother of Jesus. Let's go, to, let's, go, let's go to James. James called us brothering. Like to the brother and to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. John calls us the beloved. But I think here tonight, let's all relate to a guy named Peter. Because I don't know if we have any Peters in the house that's still kind of cursing a little bit. You know what I'm saying? That might deny Jesus on a Tuesday, but come in church and be holy on a Sunday. You know what I'm saying? I like, I, I like, like, let's go with Peter. The dude that'll still get into it. Try my Jesus, I'll cut your ear off. Like, you know, and I'm going to wait, Jesus, I'm going to let Jesus patch it up because I ain't going to repent. You know, like, like, I like Peter. You know what I'm saying? Like, if I was back then, I think I'd hang with Peter. You know, like, me and Pete, good. Send us out two by two, me and Pete, dog. You know, I like Peter. But I think Peter called us something so profound, I think we need to lean into so we can get some benefits from. And we're going to pray. Because I think if we grab this name and the significance in the name, we get the benefits out of the name. First Peter. Let's check it out. First Peter, chapter two. And I read it on the screen. 
Here we go. First Peter chapter two. It says, come to Jesus Christ. He is the living stone people have rejected. But which God has chosen and highly honored. And now you, everybody say you. you. Everybody say you. you. And now you are. Oh, Peter. Hold on. Now I heard Paul, I'm a, the body of Christ. Now I heard I'm a Christian. Now I heard I'm the bride of Christ. I heard I'm a saint. I heard I'm faithful. I heard I'm brethren. I heard I'm beloved. But I am a living stone? That's a great name. But what does it mean? But you are a living stone. Listen to this, guys. Being used to build a spiritual house. Amen. You are also a group of holy priests. And with the help of Jesus Christ, you will offer. Look at it. With the help of Jesus Christ, because we are a living stone, with the help of Jesus Christ, campuses, we will offer sacrifices pleasing to God. Anybody want to please God? You'll never forget this. you never forget it. So if you're taking notes, I titled this message and we're going to pray for the Jacksonville Jaguars. I keep getting all these great draft picks. And let us down. You never forget. You never forget. I titled this message. You will never forget. Look at your neighbor and say, you will never forget. You never forget. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you so much for our time together. Thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Father, we ask you right now to just, just continue to just pour into our heart. Right, give us a revelation, Lord Jesus, that will just reveal you that nothing can take away like your word say. It's no, it's no devil in hell. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And now I'm going to say our selfish prayer collectively for the Jacksonville Jaguars. I'm going to say it, Lord Jesus. Like, you know, that Trevor gets a lifetime sponsorship from Great Clips. And, um, you know, it's his lifetime. He have a haircut. And we give you all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say. Amen. 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 Peace up. A town down. We're going to watch you. You, le- you leaving? What, you going to stay right there? No, we just want to see what you're going to do. Like, this, I'm, just, I'm just curious. Because some people just, you know, like, they, I, I just, just want to watch how you get out. <laughs> hey, I like it. Because he had a swivel chair. He, like, it, it's just like he... T- like he <laughs> that's cool, that's cool. Any uh, married couples in the room? Raise your hand. Awesome, awesome. Married men, raise your hands. Okay, awesome, awesome. That's awesome. Praise God. Yeah, right? Yeah. Question. Just be open and honest. We can do that. We're family, okay? Men, do your wife ever ask you what type of lady you would have married if you wouldn't have married her? Now, I'm nervous right now. You took your hand. See, my, my man right there took his hand off. Like, like, I, like, I'm, like I'm scared right now. Like, I'm like, serious, straight up. I don't know if, like, I got to do number one and number two. I'm nervous right now. That's that question. I, I don't know if my wife be setting me up, but why would she do that? Like, Pastor Tim, what response is appropriate? No, I'm still, no, I have not answered the question. But, uh, students, listen, ladies. Let me pass, let me, you know what, let me junior pass to you because you got a senior pass, okay? Let me junior pass to you. Please don't ask your husband that question. <laughs> For the sake of, like, like, just Amsterdam. Don't ask, 
I don't know what to do. And she asked me, and she just had the most, she got blue eyes, and she has the most intense just male. I'm already nervous. What type of wife would you have married if it wasn't me? What are we trying to do? Like, what are we trying to do right now? So now if, I'm dis- if I don't say it, I'm like jammed. But if I say it, I'm jammed. So I don't know what to say. So I'm going to answer the question for my own conscience in front of you guys. She's not watching. <laughs> but I got to get it out because I got to practice. Because one day I'm going to have to answer this question. So I think I narrowed it down to two. Right? I used to date this girl in... Uh... <laughs> hey, yo, where you at, keyboard? <laughs> so... She was a Haitian in, 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 um, in like college. She was cool. Cool girl. She was cool. Like, you know, she was all right. She was nice. You know, love Jesus, whatever. But then it take me back to my first white girl I dated in high school. Now, me, I moved from Louisiana. Now, it's okay, y'all. It's all right. I moved from Louisiana, and it was just like no, like, no, like you, no convergence of races at all. White people over there, black people over there in Louisiana. And I moved to Birmingham, Alabama, and I seen like black dudes holding white girls' hands. So I'm like, and I seen them walking in the hallway. So I'm like, hold on, stop that. <laughs> you, you just can't do that. And they was like, they was like, they was like, what do you mean? I was like, no, you can't do that. They was like, well, like, we good. Like, what are you talking about? And so, but then my dude told me it was this girl named Deanna Hogan, and she liked me. So I'm like, really? And I found out Deanna Hogan, daddy, was a doctor. So I'm really like, really? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I'm like, oh, let me be what that be like, Benny Benny Boom. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, man, Deanna, like, daddy, a doctor. Deanna had a lake house. And man, I used to go skiing in the lake house. And I'm like, I'm going skiing, y'all. Like, water skiing, like, real water. Like, listen. Like water skin, right? And so I'm downstairs. Like, it's, listen, language barriers everywhere. I'm like downstairs, little hood. I'm like, yo, Deanna, yo, fix me a sandwich. She's like, what is a sandwich? I'm like, well, I put these wet clothes. She's like, in a hammock. I'm like, what is a hammock? Like, it's just, just, just missing each other all the time. Like, you know what I'm saying? But Deanna, daddy was a doctor. Everybody say doctor. You never forget this. I promise you, you're never gonna forget it, right? So now, my birthday came. And she asked my homeboy, what did I want for my birthday? And I told my dude, I want some Allen Iversons. Anybody remember those shoes? So Allen Iverson is my favorite basketball player. So she got me these Allen Iversons. And the reason I like Allen Iverson, because he was very creative. He was very creative. Like he was the, I ain't going to say the first, but he was a very, like he was like Pete Maravich. He was like a very creative basketball player. So Allen Iverson created this move called the killer crossover. The killer crossover. And he was known for it. And the killer crossover was crazy deadly because nobody could stop it because how he set his opponents up. So he used to dribble the ball just to show you. He used to dribble, and I'm not going to do it because I might break my ankle, and now y'all got to get me out of here for real. So he used to dribble the ball, and when his opponent come, he used to move the ball over to his right, and he was, his his, his arms were so long, he moved the ball over to his right, and when his opponent reached for it, he would swing it back to his left and create separation. But what they figured out was, this move is a little bit unfair. Because he creates so much distance in his separation. And they was like, Alan, we don't know if that move is legal. Especially when he crossed Michael Jordan over one time. He went down on Michael Jordan and he crossed Jordan and everybody's seen the greatest player to ever play the game get embarrassed from all the separation that Allen Iverson created. And what they deemed was it was danger in the distance. It was danger in the distance. So much so, they made it illegal. God seen danger in the distant. From the concept of separation, so much so, he made distance illegal. That's why we do groups. Why? Because it's danger in the distance. 
That's why the Bible talks to us, do not forsake the assembling of the saints because it's danger in the distance. That's why the Bible talks about we're the body of Christ. Why? We're one because it's danger in the distance. That's why the, body, that's why the Bible says neither male, neither female, neither bond, neither Jew, all are one in Christ Jesus because it's danger in the distance. So anytime you get distant, danger so the enemy tells you, hey, go be by yourself and be isolated, all to yourself, no accountability, danger. Hey, don't submit to the church, danger. Just have your own Jesus, private Jesus by yourself in your private closet, danger. Hey, don't be generous to people so it won't impact others. Keep it all for yourself, danger. It's danger in the distance. So, if we become distant of the names that we are called, could it be danger? If we become distant in the names that we are called, could it be danger? Living stones. Let's close the distance. Why are we called living stones? Let's close the distance. So now if we close the distance, we can receive the benefits out of being called something that God called us. Let's just go back to the, let's just go back to the beginning of how and why the Bible calls us in the New Testament living stones. Let's go back to Joshua real quick. And we're going to look real quick and we're going to see what God meant by his danger in the distance. Check it out. Joshua chapter four. So Joshua chapter, everybody with me? Awesome. So Joshua chapter four, right here in Joshua chapter four, this is when the children of Israel, they travel around the mountain and now they're about to go into the promised land. And Moses is not going to take them in. Joshua is going to take them in. So they're at the promised land, this place that they wanted to get all their life. Some of us, we have places that we are called to be at, but we seem sometimes they can't get there. They're at this place. And so now in front of them, they have 31 kings that they should conquer. But before they conquer the 31 kings, they have to cross the Jordan River. So now they get to the Jordan River and Joshua tell the whole nation, millions of people, he tell the whole nation this right here. After Israel had crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, tell one man from each 12 tribes to pick up a large rock where the priests are standing. Pick up a large rock where the priests are standing. Some of you in your heart are going to flash back to Peter because it sounds like Peter language. Then tell the men to set up those rocks as a monument at the place where you camp tonight. Joshua chose 12 men, then he called them together and said, Go to the middle of the riverbed where the sacred chest is, that's talking about the Ark of the Covenant, and pick, up a lar- and pick up a large rock. Carry it on your shoulders to our camp. There are 12, there are 12 of you who would be, I mean, who would be one rock for each tribe. So he's saying it's 12 rocks that represent each 12 tribes. Someday, here it is, guys, someday your children will ask, why are these rocks here? Then you can tell them the water stopped flowing when the chest was being carried across the river. These rocks will always remind, everybody say remind. Remind. You'll never forget. Everybody say remind. remind. You'll never forget. These rocks will always remind our people of what happened here today. So what he's saying is he was gonna put something down that people will always notice the thing that he put down to remind them how faithful God was right then. You'll never forget. These rocks will always remind our people of what happened here today. The men followed the instructions that the Lord had given Joshua. They picked up 12 rocks, each tribe, and they carried them to the camp where they put them down, Joshua set up a monument next to the place where the priests were standing. This monument 
was always made of 12 large rocks and it is still there in the middle of the river. So what happened was, guys, Joshua set up these 12 rocks to show the people that God had came through for us and we have the victory because of God. But it was a dilemma. They could not stay at those rocks because when they went that way, they created distance from the rocks. So therefore, another generation, if they're not close to the rocks, they can probably forget what God had brought them through. Because now it was distance in the rock because the monument, which was the rocks, was not mobile. Because a monument, all you do is you think about a monument. When we think about the Lincoln Monument, the Lincoln Monument is in Washington, D.C. When I went and visited Washington, D.C., I was like, wow, this is awesome. But as soon as I came back to Atlanta, which was nine hours in driving, the distance was there. And when the distance was created, the forgetness, the forgetfulness was also. That's why one of the number one commands in Scripture is do not forget. You'll never forget this. So God in his ingenuity, because he didn't want us to forget and he didn't want the distance to get in between of what he'd done and the rocks that we've seen, he was so unique, he created us the rocks and made the rocks mobile. That's why the Bible says... We are a living stone because now we're mobile and everywhere we go, we offer up sacrifices to show people what God has did in our life. You will never forget it. Why will you never forget it? Because you are it. You are it. So every time your friends are around you, every time the world is around you, every time the world encounters you, they are encountering a living stone, a living monument that shows them the goodness, the greatness, the mercy, the grace, the forgiveness, the truth, the benefits of God. But sometimes us as the monument, the living monument, We create distance because we forget. That's why he said never forget. Never forget. Never forget you are it. Because soon as we forget, guys, we stop the benefits. Soon as we forget, we stop the benefits. I was with my pastor one time. We was going on a trip. And, um... We, we left the office together and was going out to go on his ministry trip and he got out of some heavy meetings and I'm with him and I'm like, man, he pretty wired up right now. I really don't want to say nothing. You know, but I got a thousand questions I want to ask him. I want to learn. Like, and, but I'm like, it's not the time to learn right now. So like, I'm like, man, I want to ask him some questions, but he's like tense because he just got out of the meeting and he's like, I'm like, man, can I ask him? Can I ask him? Can I ask him? And I didn't ask him. But as we get on the plane together, we start... To, we started to get on our trip and we get maybe 30 minutes in I started noticing looking at his iPad now I'm going to keep it real I eavesdrop like, I, like, like straight up if you're on your phone I'm like this like I'm just checking you know what I'm saying I want to see we have an accountability partner so I'm, I'm checking you know so I'm looking I'm looking over and, and, and I listen, this is real I start to feel the environment change and I kept peeking over and where he was he was in his photos. And he was scrolling through his photos and it was lighting his face up. And then I asked him, I said, hey, Pastor Chris, what are you looking at? He's like, look, man, I almost hit a hole in one right there. This is when Johnny was born. Man, this is me, this is me and Tammy. Look at, it, look, at look, look how strong I look when I was married to her. Look at I me mean, when we got, in, we got engaged. Look, look at me. I had a six pack. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> it changed everything. He started to remember. And the remembering changed everything in his psyche. And his psyche changed everything in his presence. Because he started to remember. Do you know $3.7 billion a year is spent on Alzheimer's in research? More than cancer. Why? Because people deem the memory more important than anything else. Because you think about it, when you remember, what do you do? Prefix re, 
suffix member. You get all the members around that moment right there and you put them together and now you go back into that place where you receive the benefits of God. So much so revelations calls it a testimony because when you put them in that moment right there, the picture, all the people in the small group, the baptism, the photographer, the generosity, you put all the members in that moment and then you share the testimony. That means the monument becomes mobile. You'll never forget it. Because now, when that memory that was here, you put it and it became mobile and you shared it with somebody that never experienced what you experienced back then, now it gives God the permission to do over, which testimony means. The permission for the Spirit of God to duplicate it in the hearer's life. You'll never forget it. You are the living stones. You are made to be a beautiful, living monument that's mobile, that goes around and let people experience the love of Christ, the grace of Christ, the goodness of God, the diversity of heaven, the riches of wealth, everything that God died for. You're it. There's nothing else. You're it. You'll never forget this. So the thing that comes between it is forgetting. And as we close, I want to talk about a few things that somebody I think we would also else hang out with, David. David was good. But it's one, I, 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 love, I love Psalms 51. I like, I like all the Psalms that David was a part of. But he was in this one particular Psalm, we call it Psalms 103. And as we go to it, it's so many things that you can remember, but I want to make sure you never forget this. It's Psalms 103. Let's read. Bless the Lord, O my soul. So what David is saying is he's making his mind, will, and emotions bless the Lord. You know why we're dealing with anxiety so much in our nation? Because we're not blessing the Lord with our soul. That is the answer. Because when we bless the Lord with our mind, will, and emotions, then our emotions will be blessed. Instead of being emotional, let's be emotionally blessed. So David was saying, bless the Lord, O my soul, in all that is within me. Bless his what? That means set apart. That means he's going to be the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's never going to change. That's agape love. Bless his holy name and do what? Forget not. Forget not. Forget not. Forget not. You'll never forget. Forget not. Forget not. Forget not. All of his benefits. Because the name that you are, you receive the benefits from. Forget not all of his benefits. Who forgives you for how many? That messes a lot of people's theology up. Who forgives you for how many? Who heals you from what? Your disease. Next verse. Who redeems your life from a pit? The outstretched arm of God. That redeemed all of us because our life can be worse. Redeemed you from the pit. Who crowns. Everybody going around, what up king? What up king? Listen. What up queen? I, I hear all that. But if you forgetting, I don't know if you're a king or queen. The people that remember are the people that gets the crown who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you. Why is the world never satisfied? Because they probably don't have the crown, love and mercy. Who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the wings of the eagle. So the first one, here's the first one, if you're taking notes. The first one is this. Never forget, I am forgiven. You'll never forget this. Never forget that I am forgiven. 
Because now that you're a mobile monument and you are a living stone, if you forget you're forgiven, the person that you meet will, will not experience the benefits of forgiveness. Let me say it again. Because you are a living stone, a mobile monument, if you forget that you're forgiven, the person that you experience at the office will never know that they're forgiven. Because we will never benefit from the idea and the truth that we're forgiving. So that's why we are a mobile monument that should never forget we was forgiven. Because the person that's struggling and having a bad day, they need to know that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. But if we forget that we're forgiven, they will never know that they're forgiving. You'll never forget this. You'll never forget that you're forgiven. Your mobile monument, a living stone, not dormant, not desolate, you're living. I will never forget I am healed. You never forget it. Never forget that you are healed. You are healed. You are healed. Peter says later, by his stripes, we were healed. He take it a step further. Never forget you are healed. Even if your body says something different. Your body does not have the legal right to trump the authority of scripture. Never forget that I'm healed. Because at the end of the day, we want to show up before Jesus and we're still saying we're healed. Because guess what? When we do show up from Jesus, if we don't get healed on this earth, your Bible will be true because you will look him in the eyes and you will be right. You are healed. Amen. Never forget. Because heal people, heal people. Amen. Moving monument. You'll never forget it. I will never forget that I'm redeemed. Redeemed means your purpose. Re, prefix. It means it was repurposed and deemed and paid for with a price. Amen. So Jesus didn't only pay for your salvation. He paid for your purpose on this earth. He redeemed it. So for those of you who are on a team, your purpose is redeemed. For those of you who need to take a next step to get on the team, your purpose is redeemed. Never forget that your purpose was redeemed. All the business leaders in the house, never forget that your purpose was redeemed. All the moms in the house, never forget that your purpose was redeemed. All the husbands in the house, never forget that your purpose was redeemed. All the students in the house, never forget you being an obedient child. To your guardians, your purpose is redeemed. And now the next generation that watch you, their purpose will redeem, be redeemed. Why? Because the monument became mobile. Amen. Never forget. Keys, you can come up. Never forget. I am crowned. I am crowned. Campuses. I am crowned. I am crowned. Ladies, you are beautiful. You are a queen. Never forget. Because soon as you forget, you would do an action to be something that you already are. And the action does not dictate your identity. Your crown dictates your identity. Your crown. Never forget it. Crowned. Significant, precious, holy, anointed. They crown the priest with anointing. That means you have the mind of Christ. The crown of thorns, the curse was lifted up and placed on his head so we wouldn't have to carry one. If anxiety comes, we tell anxiety to hold up in the name of Jesus because it does not have the right to take my crown of peace off. There's so much coming at the mind of our young people. You're crowned. You don't have to get a crown. You are crowned. It's not about a blue check. It's not about likes. It's not about retweets. It's not, no, no. You are crowned. 
You're crowned. You're crowned. Dads, you're doing a great job. I know the pressure's coming. I got to provide for my family, go to work. I'm trying to be a spiritual man of God. I'm trying to lead. I'm trying to do this. And sometimes I don't hear the affirmation that I want to hear at home. You are crowned. Moms, great job. Bible talks about love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. I think the first step, it's okay to love yourself. You deserve it. Some of you work two jobs. You pray. Nobody said thank you. I see you. He sees you. So much so that he gave you the crown from his head. So that you can move with gratitude, with confidence in front of the next mom that feels she's never even seen. You're crowned. And the reason we have to know we're crowned is because we should be satisfied. Nothing else satisfies us. It's but you, Jesus. I would never forget. I am satisfied. Because as soon as I forget I'm not satisfied, I start reaching for other things that I find satisfaction in. And none of those things will fill me. He says he's the water. He says he's the bread. He's the body. None of those things will satisfy us. teams come up we're satisfied because satisfaction guys it's needed in this day and age because we can walk around confident I go to a life giving church I have a life giving God I have a life giving life I am the recipient of the kingdom of God and I walk in this earth with no fear in my eye no trepidation in my heart no timidity in my guard because I am a monument that's meant to move to let people experience the sacrifice the boldness the greatness of God it's nothing that I want to taste more than Jesus. It's no bread on this earth that I'd rather have more than Jesus. It's no bottle. It's no wine. You are the living water that I drink, that I eat, that I yearn for. You're it, Jesus. And here's why. Here's why I can tell you satisfaction pays for everything. Because this guy right here, let me show you this guy. 19 years ago, facing 20 to life in prison. That guy name is Mayo so well, who they call G-Code. Did a federal prison sentence because he wanted the world to satisfy him. He wanted girls to satisfy him. He wanted money to satisfy him. He wanted fame to satisfy him because he never tasted the satisfaction of Jesus. But one day, when this guy came in prison and he told me about Jesus, that this stone could be mobile, that I can have this living cornerstone in my heart, that I can become a king, that I can become a priest, that he'll put the crown on my head, that he'll put redemption in my heart, that he'll redeem me, he'll satisfy me, he'll set me free. I started to move and be mobile. I didn't stay still. I took it everywhere around this world. So Atlanta, Georgia, they're going to see moving monuments that have sacrifices for God. You can stay on your seat. Stay, on your, stay, stay, stay. This is this church. Moving monuments. That's in the grocery store. That's in the workplace. That's in the football field. That's in the hallways. That's in the youth groups. That's everywhere in this city that people are going to experience the love and grace of God because you will never forget. 
You're living. You're living. So now, this song we're about to sing, it means so much more. Because he is so good. Because he didn't leave you there. He gave you a testimony and gave you some wheels. And said, get on out there and let people experience me through you. Because you're mobile. God is good. That's why he said, 1 Corinthians 13. Every time you get together, what we just did, we broke bread, we drank wine, but he said, before he did all that, do this in. You'll never forget it. You'll never forget it. Every time you get together, that little cup is mobile. You can do it anytime. The bread in the body of Jesus Christ that you're taking it in and you're becoming it. Every time. Every time. Every time. It's for him. Totally Jesus. You're so good, Jesus. You're so good, Jesus.